Hi there. Welcome. My name is Ram Samocha. I'm the director of Draw to Perform, a few of you uh, know. And uh, we are here in uh, our um, uh, online program, the Draw to Perform online program, where we are visiting studios of artists that relate to action and drawing. We're trying to stretch it to uh, different directions and views, expressions. And today we have with us uh, Monica Weiss. Thank you for joining and collaborating with us, Monica, here in this uh, session. And I would like to thank uh, all of you here uh, for joining us and supporting and contributing to the future uh, events and activity of Draw to Perform. I really appreciate it. And I, I'm sure we will have quite an interesting talking about drawing in action. In a multidisciplinary practice that encompasses video, film, performance, sound, drawing and sculpture, the Polish-American artist Monica Weiss moves between the political and the poetic to explore questions of the body, history and gendered violence. Her work is intimately engaged with processes of witnessing and remembering, as it attends to traumatic histories, their transmission and commemoration. Weiss frequently employs her own body to navigate the aftermath of different traumas, raising questions of how one can articulate these without enacting further violence. The female body does not only become a vehicle of expression, but also forms a key site from which an effective politics may emerge through touch, vulnerability and the visceral. Her mixed media and body practice foreground sensing as a modality through which we can develop an ethics and politics of remembrance and of being together in the world, simultaneously challenging modernist assumptions concerning a duality of mind and body. By frequently attending to events and histories that she has not personally witnessed, Vice fleshes out the multi-directional character of memory and seeks to forge new solidarities that exceed national boundaries. Born in Warsaw, Poland, Monica Weiss arrived to NYC in 2001 as the long-term artist in residence at the Experimental Intermedia Foundation. Since 2011, she divides her time between her studio in New York and her appointment as Associate Professor at Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts, Washington University in St. Louis. Excellent. Thank you very much, Alma. This series of meetings are meant to be a more non-formal meetings where we can have the, uh, the opportunity to visit artists in their studios, to talk with them and to brainstorm about, uh, about subjects that relate to their practice and the, the process of sharing the work uh, with others. I would like to start by saying uh, that for me, uh, I, I know uh, Monica's work for uh, quite a long time now. And uh, since I started uh, my first action, drawing action in uh, 2004, I uh, found myself going back to Monica, uh, to your work, being inspired by uh, the many options that you put us there to, to check, to, to understand and, and to think about. Monica is really, a, is really a multidisciplinary artist. The component of drawing in, a, in your work is a, only one thing, kind of like go and get together a, like a puzzle and build up, build up the, the, the body of work create uh, those uh, moments that is, give us uh, understanding and uh, going deeper. When I I'm keep uh, getting back to your work, I really, I really think that I just uh, have a hint of what there is underneath. That's why I'm really uh, thrilled for this uh, meeting with you, for this short meeting with you. And that's one of the reasons I invited you uh, to, uh, to understand and to kind of like extend my knowledge uh, about your work. I'm looking forward for this meeting and thank you, Monica, again, for being with us. The stage is yours. Thank you so much for inviting me. And drawing has been always uh, at the forefront or at the core of my practice, but in uh, sometimes unexpected ways. And I think I would like to begin today, if you don't mind, by playing a short six-minute studio visit from 
right before the pandemic, immediately followed by introduction to my current project. Excellent. Okay, so we'll uh, share it now, I hope, uh, the video. continue slowly and gently and stop untie it very slowly For many years I used to work mostly with my own self as a subject and then I had uh, large-scale projects where I would invite pedestrians, random people, to inhabit my drawing landscapes. I love to work with my subjects so that they are literally and explicitly so slow and always moving at the same time and always present in an extremely intense way without even a trace of drama. Paper is, uh, uh, always excites me, even completely untouched virgin paper makes me feel so happy. <laughs> Later on I, I began performing on drawing and with drawing, so it became sort of like a large project with shrouds in wrapping whole sites where, you know, me and, and my performers, we would lie down and draw with our eyes closed and it would be still the same drawing for me as it is in my studio. What I'm really truly interested in uh, projection, cinematic projection, is the tension that happens between the reality, the real event, and the projected one, and how they commune together. And this third entity happens, which is kind of amazing because it points at something mystical. Mystics have been trying across cultures and times to find a way to levitate, if you will, not literally. Uh, to go outside of one's body, but to leave the quotidian and to find this other sort of epiphany or um, exaltation. We can achieve a possibility of imagining a different version of reality. The feeling of, of being outside of our confines, specifically time. <laughs> The way I record the voices usually is I ask my singing and speaking subjects to give a lot of space, you know, between words. What then I can do with them is I reverse them or overlap them and they become polyphonic choral falling apart of language. We are forgetful, so much so that we have forgotten what it means to be, to be present, to be alive. I often end up repeating almost the same passages in sound and in projection and in performance. 
and through that sort of level of um, growing slowly intensity, I hope to um, create a space of remembering. My name is Monika Weiss and I'm of course honored to be part of this program and the series. And today I wanted to think together with you about drawing as performance and as duration, time, as music and as lament. And I was originally trained as a musician. I went to Warsaw School of Music and my mother was a pianist uh, and a piano professor and she was my first music teacher. Um, she gave me music and by extension she gave me an understanding of time and duration, sequencing of time and interval of time. But I, what I also learn every day from music is that uh, sound and art making is about touching and about evoking affect and emotion. And from, from music I learn how to work with my own body and with bodies of others, especially other women. I work with time as my main medium and with duration and also with body in states of stillness and suspension and duration. I choreograph women to perform slow gestures of lamentation. I work with drawing in my studio the way I work with sound in my studio and with film. I often allow the contingency to be my partner in this case, working with water and graphite powder and resin, awaiting for um, the materials to merge together in a kind of choreography of movement. I think of drawing as relating to my performance and film and sound practice in a sense that it's a synesthetic approach. I think of drawing as a surface, but also as dialogue Often my drawings come in pairs or in series and they are in a conversation with one another, but also with the viewer. When I work with performers, I choreograph the gestures and, the, and I film my choreography. And then later it becomes also a surface, a projected surface of a film that evokes a moment of stillness and gradual change. I was originally trained as a musician, as I mentioned, but also as a painter. Um, it was one of my first large-scale installations in which the painterly image uh, that you see on the wall in the back became a film projection. But I often work, almost always, work with a very stationary camera view. And so nothing changes really, except that the figures portrayed in my films breathe and very slowly and very gently move. It's also the first time that I created first of the series of sculptural objects, Enoya. From that project on, I've continued to create a series of immersions. This project was the beginning of my imagining of inhabiting in real time or in a film time a vessel, which is one of the most important parts of my ongoing practice. In Enoya, I immerse my body for several hours in water. And in the same series, I also create sculptures which immersion is projected back into the water, creating a ghostly re-inhabitation. And my work often tends to focus on depicting past presence. And so hence the drawing becomes also in that context, 
a trace of presence, an interval of time. Another vessel in a series of my sculptures is this one, Letter Room from 2004, here seen at the Lehman College Art Gallery, in which I inhabited this sculpt and I drew around my body an embedding of hundreds of layers of paper, which when I was not inside of the sculpture would move up and down through a system of electronic motor lifting it up and down in a rhythm that was inspired by 11th century composer Hildegard von Bingen. This project also is about containing of the body and also about the overflow of the sound and of the movement. And yet the body doesn't go anywhere. Another work from that earlier time, from 2003, from the Whitney Museum of American Art, where I invited children to inhabit large-scale drawing with me together. Another project from that time, a space of Chelsea Art Museum and crawling on the ground covered by white paper and leaving marks of my body, creating this living painting. The initial interest in the phenomenology of the body and how the body relates to space, its shrouding, its tracing, led me to, to be more and more interested in history and how we can trace and mark our relationship to history through the engagement with the body as a space of affect. My performance at the World Financial Center Winter Garden, where I was invited by the Drawing Center in New York, it's a project which I created in response to the Ground Zero. The workers were still searching for the remains of the victims. I recorded the sound of the space a few months earlier before the piece. The sound that I recorded and recomposed electronically was then played from under the pizza around the trees. Pedestrians were invited to join me in this drawing and marking performance. A landscape of drawing, a few years later in 2012, performance with women, uh, local women in Jelonagura, whom I invited to perform on the grounds of the former German concentration camp in Gruenberg, where young Jewish women perished in one of the death walks at the end of the war. What I wanted to do and what I choreographed them to do is slow gestures of lamentation, which were almost like drawing to me. Our bodies were markings on that abandoned and forgotten today space. In 2018, I was invited by the city of Dresden to form as part of a commemoration of um, destruction and liberation of Dresden that was at the end of the war. And I was lying on a bedding of books published before the Second World War, both those that were favored by Nazis and those that were burned by them, creating a new layer through the drawing of memory and trace. A similar series of projects, and this one was in Berlin in 2009, in which I was spitting black ink onto the pages of Goethe, marking and as if speaking into the 49 volumes of writings of Goethe. Another edition of this project at Kunsthaus Dresden, an exhibition that was originally commissioned by the Uyazdowski Castle in Warsaw and traveled to Santiago, Chile. And the project also traveled to Dubai, a performance-based installation that contains a large-scale shroud on which myself and invited local women were performing in Porto, Portugal, Thank you, Paolo, for being here and for inviting me to do this project. It was recently shown in an exhibition at the Museo, and it was part of an exhibition commemorating Leonardo da Vinci's and his work. The relationship between the shroud, the remnants of the drawing, and the scarves that me and my performers left in a gesture of communal lamentation. And this is a close-up view of the shroud, which remains in the collection of the museum. And I'm going to end with a few words about my current project. Who is remembered and who is forgotten? And how do we unforget violence? in order to remake the world without it. Nubaya is named for Jyoti Singh, aka Nubaya, she, fearless, who was raped and killed at the age of 23 in New Delhi in 2012. 
It is a memorial not for conquerors and war heroes, but for forgotten victims of everyday violence. In Nubaya, I place a triumphal arch down, mirroring it with its own double to create a vessel filled with water. The triumphal arch no longer hovers above us. Instead, we look down into the water and see a specter of a woman, her body shrouded in a black robe and veil, her face morphing from one woman into another, making slow, universal gestures of lamentation. She eventually becomes a tree. The silence of the Nirbaya monument is accompanied by a sequence of sound compositions. My piano improvisations are transformed into a polyphonic and ambisonic environment evoking Daphne, the mythological nymph that escaped rape through becoming a tree. The music evokes her skin hardening into a tree bark, her voice becoming a whispering leaves. The escape from the violence is marked by her death, but also by reincarnation into a new life form. Resembling an ancient sarcophagus, Nubaya honors women of all cultures and times who continue to undergo the trauma of rape, torture and death. A site of meditation and stillness, the monument offers a pathway for reimagining collective remembrance, abandoning victorious monumentality, and celebrating the horizontal and peaceful future of humanity. As part of the series of projects surrounding this uh, monument, and I've also recently finished a series of large-scale drawings, you see them behind me. They also appear in some of the films and will also appear in the actual monument. This is one of the pieces currently actually on view in an exhibition in Poland. In uh, the Polish Center of Polish Sculpture in Orojsko, the exhibition bears the same title as the monument itself. Um, and if you happen to come to Poland before July 11th, please visit the exhibition. Finally, another premiere that just happened online is a collaboration with composer Zaid Jabri uh, from Syria. And together we are commemorating Rachel Corey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica, for putting together this presentation for us. It's a, a selection of a few works from the many that you have and uh, it was really quite fascinating to mm -hmm. go with you over this. I, I think uh, your work is very poetic and uh, one of the things that I uh, wrote here from your presentation is the combination memory and trace which is beautiful in my opinion. This part of the past and the trace and uh, that uh, link it together and and get us to be part of it or to examine it or to think about it and we're here in your studio <laughs> so i'm um, kind of like th there are a million of questions to think about but uh, may maybe i'll i'll jump and uh, ask you about the studio, about the place that you are working in New York. How it does, how do you work there? Because we said that you're working on few media and I guess working with the computer also. So how, how does it all come together in the studio maybe? So, you know, I, right now I'm sitting by the most important, perhaps the heart of my studio, which is the piano. I often, you know, improvise on the piano 
then later translated into electronic um, and layered sound that you encounter in my practice. There is something very important about touching piano every day. And um, allowing the sound to say something to me, which is a little bit similar to the way I feel about paper when I draw. It allows me to hear something, you know, it says something, the, the emptiness of the white paper and the emptiness of no sound with the sound. Right now, of course, I'm responding to the rain. I think the, the window that I'm looking at from time to time because of the rain that accompanies us today, I don't think I would be able to work without light. I think as much as I work with projection and I often have to cover the windows, you know, when I want to project the image that I'm right. working. Right. Um, I saw the projection. But the, the, the light is extremely important to me. I film film all of my pieces that I choreograph with performers or with my own self in daylight. Daylight is, is uh, magical. I, I think daylight also speaks to me. So, yeah. And Monica, when you are working in your studio, usually you're working when you're drawing or working, uh, is it on the ground or on, on wall or uh, on a shelf or how that? How, how usually you're, you're used to? I think all of the above, but mostly underground. Underground. Underground, yes. As you see behind me here, um, I just opened one of the one of the darkness that you know are all here in their specific site specific boxes. <laughs> They've all all were born um, underground. You know, sometimes for many days as the media would dry gradually and I would spend time, even lie down with them just to wait for them to happen. And what you see behind me right now is actually um, in the same series from, from last summer. This one is devoted to George Floyd. I made this diptych when George Floyd was killed. Hmm. It's interesting, you know, because uh... As you're talking or as you showing us uh, your studio or as you're talking ab about the rain, it's uh, I've, I'm feeling in my body that there is a, a different tempo that's happening with you and your studio. So you allow yourself to take the time or to just pose or just uh, as you described, just lying down uh, with your drawing. This is something that never happened to me before. It sounds logic <laughs> when I think about it. It's just like sometimes, sometimes you you have to uh, give yourself the time and focus, even if it's uh, on nothing, just time passing by. Thanks for uh, reminding me that. It's really special, I think. Will you? Will I, uh, is it okay for me to ask you if you can show us a little bit close up of a few of the drawings? If you do have them there, because I think I can show um, maybe one or two small drawings. The big ones are very fragile. The very small drawings. Not sure if you can see. It's an example of a recent series that is water based, and I've been working with a lot with graphite powder and with water. In a sense, they're very performative because I allow the, the accident and the contingency first to take over the space of the paper. And then, and then I interfere. So it's a kind of musical in that sense. You know, first I hear what it wants to tell me and then I act upon it. So you mix the graphite with quite uh, with not that much uh, water. Uh, not country, a lot of water. Really? So how how it becomes uh, so dark and uh, the 
Because from my experience, uh, graphite powder, powder intend to easily disappear after an action or after uh, dealing with it. It's really uh, hard to fix it. Mm -hmm. I use a combination of media, so I think a lot of it is experimentation and a lot of it is developed over the years where I, I capture the movement that happens on the page. I, I work with resin a lot as well, so there's also some resin here. And Maybe we can talk and then break it through with some film and sound. Excellent. So I'll share the gallery. Okay. Hi, everybody. Is there anybody that would like to ask uh, Monica something relating to work we see and tour in the studio? Yes, Marega, you have to unmute yourself. It was lovely seeing your work, Monica. It's very inspiring and there, there's lots there. But one of the things I, I was curious about when you were showing some of your other work, and especially when you're working with other people, um, do you choreograph them at all, or do you, you do, or do you give them certain instructions and let them improvise within it? That's a very good, good question. Yeah. It depends on the project, but in majority of my projects and works, I choreograph every movement, every moment. And sometimes we spend a week of time, we try this particular movement. It's not really physically consuming as it is emotionally consuming for my performers and for myself. We try to arrive at a moment where the expression is right. And so this is for like single performers, women come to my studio and I work with them or I work with them on location. And in some other pieces or projects, it's a little bit more open-ended because it, it is a landscape where people come with specific instructions, for example, silence, with specific gestures that we try together. The rest is just um, happening in real time. Can I extend uh, the question maybe and ask uh, about the audience participation? Because I, no I noticed that quite few uh, pieces of you, you open the, the action to the audience to join you. So would you be able to tell a little bit uh, about uh, the instructions you give them or uh, how you create it? Or I mean, in, in those situations where audience members were invited to participate, it would be the, the institution or the organizers who would give certain directives. I wouldn't call them instructions, but more like limitations. Usually it's about sound. I am very interested in my audience remaining silent. It's particularly difficult sometimes, I think, because of the way we are used to being always in a space of sound and change, yes? So to, to stop and be silent for someone who comes to an exhibition is, a, is an unusual situation. Absolutely. Through which I am hoping to create a sense of sharing of the space of lament or, or the space of, of um, gesture. So I, 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 I wouldn't differentiate so strongly between projects with participation and without because i think all of my projects are in a sense about this that participation in in the forthcoming monument the audience members will also remain silent but also uh, people will be able to see the reflection of themselves in the water in which the projected image will appear but in the project near the ground zero the drawing center had sort of stationed people who were on the periphery of the landscape of drawing and they were giving those directions as you say meaning please remain silent and take your shoes off <laughs> uh -huh. but otherwise people were just lying down and following my lead in a sense because i was lying down with my eyes closed and drawing around my body for many hours and for a few days so you, you didn't give them or somebody uh, or they read that they should trace themselves? They just followed you? The drawing center did tell them that if, if you want to enter the space, you can be inside, please lie down and, and don't speak. But there were crayons and graphite pieces spread around, even charcoal, and so it was intuitive. intuitive yeah. Thanks. Anybody else would like to ask Monica? 
question? Yes, I would. Um, thank you, Monica. I find your work very, very moving. I'm particularly interested in the works that I can see in the studio behind you. And I'm really interested in your relationship to surface. Um, and I guess I'm interested to know uh, at what point surface becomes an intention? How do you choose what surface you work with? Thank you. I have been interested in surface, even though I was trained as a musician, I also would draw since my childhood. The touching of paper and the paper as such is a very interesting material to me, as well as human skin and fabric. And all of them somehow I feel relate to one another. So one can be an equivalent for the other symbolically. Daphne series that you see behind me are on the Japanese rice paper. I've been working on rice paper since roughly 2005. This specific format and this particular size of the paper to me uh, is large enough to contain human body or a memory of the human body, if you thought of it as an imprint. But I also work with fabric in uh, performance-based, large-scale drawing landscapes where the mark emerges through a feeling rather than through controlled gesture. There's no representation directly. It's another form of representation. Thank you. Monica, can you tell us a little bit about the relationship or uh, your approach uh, to photography or photographing yourself? Or Because one of the things that are really, like I, I know quite a few, quite a lot of students also asked me about the relationship to photography and what are you doing with photography? Are you displaying it next to the work? Are you present it as a piece? Are you printed the images later on? With, with my work, it's, a, it's, it's multiple choices there. Do you work with photography as like as a negative or do you, maybe I'll ask it differently. Is your action or recording your action by photographing it or video it, using it as a negative where you are able to transfer it or move it to another medium or to rework on it or to combine and collage it with something else? Everything that I create performatively becomes something else. Yeah. I, I don't think there was ever uh, any instance of it not becoming something else. So it becomes a film, becomes a record that is then a work of art that is, you know, montaged and edited by me. Uh, Sorry, is it because of the performative attitude of yours? Is it because you're starting with performative gesture? I'm not sure I understand the question. Because what, what, what do you mean? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering if because you are uh, starting with a performative gesture, it leads you to record it and then to transfer it and to work, to move it to other medium or... I, I don't think this is such a equation. I don't think there is this sort of sequen sequence of events always. I think that sometimes I respond to an event or to a site. Sometimes I start with sound. Uh, sometimes I start with the choreography, as you say, but it continues. You know, I, I don't think that the choreography ever stops. It continues when I edit. It continues when I recompose sound, when I add people's voices, when I create kind of like a new hall. Yes. I wouldn't say that one leads to another. I think they're all synesthetic. This is really interesting. Sorry that I'm... Uh pointing on it. So will you be able to guide us or direct us maybe uh, just a tiny through your process? So like when you are thinking about the work, are you firstly thinking about the sound of it or uh, your movement or uh, a gesture or is it all comes together as one? Mm -hmm. So if I think, for example, about the project called Flegaton Milczenie, I was invited in 2005 by a curator in Potsdam near Berlin, and that was my first German project. Before I even proposed exactly what I will make, I had a dream. I, I dreamed about book burnings, and 
I thought, okay, I'm, I have to do something with that fire. So I, I got Dr. Faustus by Thomas Mann, an old edition, and I recorded the sound of the book burning in, in the fireplace and also filmed it. So it gave me sound and that sound I re-edited. I added a choral of voices into the sound of the burning book which is very, very percussive, an amazing sound. And it took a long time for it to burn. And it was heartbreaking, of course, but amazing. And with that, I went to Germany and I performed on my first bedding of books, drawing around my body. The sound of the burning book was first, and that informed my action, if you will, later. Oh, interesting. Thank you. So the... the the recording of the burning book was not there at the end of the action or at the end of the work. It was, it was, it all became one. One. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Back to photography, maybe? Quite a lot of uh, work. There is quite a lot of images took from above. Can you try a little bit to uh, explain why is it so, the, the above look? I work with horizontality and with landscape. And so the aerial view is very important to me because then everything looks like a drawing. Yes, everything mm -hmm. becomes a map of a situation. Yeah. So um, it's definitely part of my work. The image that you saw from the former and now abandoned and forgotten German concentration camp now in Poland, all of it was done from earlier viewpoint, from an airplane, actually, that I filmed and photographed this project to see it from an elevated viewpoint to have a sense of a larger context, in a sense, flattening it, yes, but also being a little bit more intimate with it as well at the same time. It's interesting the because also the latest project nearby is kind of like you looking from above, right? Yes, exactly. So it's both a kind of a form of levitation, but also falling down. Vertical posture of the body or viewing the world has something to do with power, a lot to do with victorious approach. Hence, triumphal artists are standing upright and lying down, especially in public space, but also symbolically laying down the body or a triumphal arch becomes a, a different viewpoint, a horizontality. Anybody else would like to ask Monica? Uh, yeah. Yes, if possible. Hello, yes. Monica. So nice to see you again. I would like to ask a question about the relationships between drawings in paper and the performances. Because I always had this impression that some of your drawings kind of uh, are... Um, sorry, I don't know if this is my... The sound is from my my recorder well from my camera well i always had this impression that you uh, that there is a kind of a displacement between what you do in your performances and what you do on paper like i don't know if it is accurate to say this but it's like in the paper you are making things that you cannot do in your performances i don't know could you comment this or could you develop this this idea so it's interesting because I, I don't know that I can step outside of them to see that difference. I am so on the inside of, of both the performance-based traces and drawings and the studio drawings. And they both for me are about an interval of time and a moment that is captured and not completely controllable, just like in music, yes. I think... It's almost like it's the opposite, like if you, if, you, if you forgive me, I feel that it's with the performance pieces is that I can step outside of what a drawing allows me in a studio context, that in for the performance, especially with my eyes closed and with others who are uncontrollable as much as I want to choreograph everybody, the drawing is unexpected. The beauty there is in this moment where I overcome the drawing or the classical understanding of drawing and it becomes just the movement and just the trace and just the memory and just the body in action. And so that's why in some of my pieces, drawing no longer appears literally. Yes, it's just there as potential through the movement. 
or in film where it's hidden among the layers of other images and other moments and the drawing is just one of them. So I think I'm trying to overcome the drawing in a traditional sense rather than to do in the drawing what I can't do in performance. <laughs> I hope that answers the question. Interesting. I think it's a, it's a good time to show a little bit short videos from uh, your actions because uh, when we first talked, uh, I mentioned that uh, it will be interesting to see the live performances. Share screen. Nós vivemos, estamos no agora. Eu lembro. Eu guardo. Quero guardar. Lençol, pano, veste. Esconde. Eu cubro-te, eu escondo-te, guardo-te, protejo-te. Com lenços, com panos, com... More. Um, so, so uh, Monica, if you can uh, check the chat, I think there are uh, two questions there uh, for you. Could you um, ask them uh, yourself? Uh, Elizabeth, uh, will yeah, you be absolutely. able? Yes. Yeah, no problem. I'm sorry, I was sort of trying to raise my hand, but I'm on my phone, so I'm wondering if it wasn't working properly so um, forgive me for that um, basically um, I was just I'm really interested in the fact that um, your uh, there's obviously a connection between a kind of feminist narrative and then notions of um, uh, the trauma and lamentation and I was particularly interested when you were talking about the collaborations that you were doing and I was wondering if you could just talk a bit more about how you sort of negotiated that in terms of um, was that incorporating uh, the individual women's narratives in some way or was that working with research? Could you just talk a little bit more about how that how that was negotiated? And then I had a more pragmatic question was just about how your practice has kind of developed and um, whether there are any recommendations that you would make in terms of for other performance artists. So a sort of conceptual and a more pragmatic question. Thank you. That's a very interesting uh, series of questions. I definitely work with or within sort of a tradition of feminist thought, feminist artworkings, which is, of course, a complex history or many histories, actually. But one of the most important trajectories that I'm, I'm very much uh, feeling close to is the understanding of the body and the mind as, as not split and the understanding of the vulnerability and the affect. I think trauma, of course, is very important. It's, it's, a, it's, a huge, it's a huge history by itself, understanding of trauma, and how can we, uh, you know, what's, what's, uh, what's the role of an artist to respond to those sites and events and voices, especially those that were forgotten. Um, so another term for the lamentation that I use um, is unforgetting. And I work with other women as my performers, so they become vehicles of this affect or this unforgetting. I don't know if I can call it exactly collaboration. Um, the way I have been so far working with other women is more like invitational. Sometimes they would come to me and they would say, I love your work and I just want to do something with you. Or I continue to be deeply honored by so many women who are interested in working with me and being choreographed by me and becoming part of my work. So I think of them rather as inhabitants those who inhabit my films and my performances rather than collaborators, although I'm very open to that happening one day. I would love to see it where the narratives of the women themselves would actually come inside of my own narratives. Um, so thank you for that question. And I think there was a third question. The third question was about advice to younger performance artists, yes, about establishing a career. I'm not sure if I, I have a specific one advice. I think that 
your your main obligation is to create strong work and the rest is always secondary <laughs> not sure if i'm right but that's been um the way i i've been trying to to work over the years thank you very much thank you for your question thanks strong work Monica, would you like to me to show uh, one more uh, to summarize, or it's okay? So perhaps I'm going to share that um, brand new piece that I mentioned. I wanted to share, and I will try to do it from my end. Perhaps sure. go ahead. As an ending, it's just a few minutes long, but it's a kind of a um, a preview of both the sound station that will be in the park, in the public park in Poland a few minutes away from the sculpture and also a preview of towards the projection that will be seen in the water and it's called metamorphoses. Monica, brilliant. Uh, it's, you know, like the layers come together and uh, create a perfect final for our uh, session here. So I would like to thank you again for opening a window yes. to in your <laughs> studio, <laughs> a rainy <laughs> one. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, for me personally, it was an, a really inspiring one. Uh, so thanks again. And uh, I hope to see you next in the next meeting uh, of Draw to Perform online. That's it for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks again.